turn now to our greeting. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Our sentence of scripture today comes from Isaiah chapter 2 verse 3. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus said this is the great and first commandment and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Lord, have mercy on us and write your law in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. The collect of the day. Almighty God, Give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put on the armour of light, now in the time of this mortal life, in which your Son Jesus Christ came, uh, came among us in great humility, that in the last day when he will come again in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, we will rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our reading. <clears throat> the Old Testament reading is from Micah, chapter 1 and chapter 2. The word of the Lord came to Micah, of Morsheth during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, kings of Judea. The vision he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear you people, all of you, listen, earth and all who live in it, that the sovereign Lord may bear witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Do not prophesy, their prophets say, do not prophesy about these things. Disgrace will not overtake us. Your descendants of Jacob, you descendants of Jacob, should it be said, does the Lord become impatient? Does he do such things? Do not my words do good to the one whose ways are upright? Lately, my people have risen up like an enemy. You strip off the rich robe, from those who pass by without a care, like men returning from battle. You drive the women of my people from their pleasant homes. You take away my blessing from their children forever. Get up, go away, for this is not your resting place because it is defiled. It is ruined beyond all remedy. If a liar and deceiver comes and says, I will prophesy for, your, for you plenty of wine and beer. That would be just the prophet for, his, for this people. I will surely gather all of you, Jacob. I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I will bring them together like sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture. The place will throng with people. The one who breaks open the way will go up before them. They will break through the gate and go out. Their king shall pass through before them, the Lord at their head. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Our psalm today is part of Psalm 80, and it's a cry of help to God for Israel. And I think if we just say the psalm together. Hear, O shepherd of Israel, 
you that led Joseph like a flock, you that are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine out in glory. Before Ephraim, Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your power and come to save us. Restore us again, O Lord of hosts. Show us the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry at your people's prayer? You have fed them with the bread of tears, given them tears to drink in good measure. You have made us the victim of our neighbours, and our enemies laugh us to scorn. Restore us again, O Lord of hosts. Show us the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. Glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as in the beginning, so now and forever. Amen. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark chapter 13. Glory to you, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the ones at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to, to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to see you here today. My name's Andrew Schmidt, in case we haven't met, and those leading the service with me are Jim, Philippa, and Andrew, uh, who's celebrating communion for us this morning. Uh, especially if you're new with us or visiting today, perhaps you're with family, uh, or you're, you've just decided that you're going to reconnect with church or you're just coming for this special occasion, whatever it may be to you, a very warm welcome to you here today. I really hope that you'll uh, join us for morning tea after the service. And if you wanted to connect with the uh, ministry staff team, uh, there is a little response card or a welcome card that you could use to fill out. You might like to put down a prayer point, make a comment or, a, uh, or have a question. Uh, that's just there in the pew for you and you could... Uh, for example, fill that out during the reflection time after the sermon and put it into the offertory. Uh, a couple of items of news. Uh, carols, which I've been talking about for weeks now, is on next week. 
Uh, that's this. That's this card, which of the, which there are still some more you could collect to invite friends. Uh, Carol says at four o'clock in the afternoon next Sunday, um, uh, uh, we should continue to pray for good weather. Uh, we're expecting under God that there will be hundreds of people there enjoying a great time and uh, uh, have, just having a, a good experience of church uh, at this Christmas time. Uh, there'll be many people there who uh, who, who are outsiders to the church, so I would definitely encourage you to be there and invite uh, friends and family along. You've also got another copy today of our Christmas invitation card. Uh, we're starting our letterbox drop this week, so if you are able to cover a section of the parish, uh, then please have a look in the porch. Uh, there are maps which show you what each zone is, uh, and uh, you could collect a bundle of cards and you just it's, make sure you sign up your name next to the zone that you've chosen, uh, and then you go out and you distribute those cards to invite the community to Christmas. Uh, just one other thing I'll mention. I, I've written a, a small uh, piece for you about the assisted dying legislation which started on the 28th of November. Uh, I'd, I think it would be great for everyone to read that. I sent it out to you by email in a link from the weekly email, but there are also some printed copies in the porch if you would like it. Let me lead us in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us in your name today. Please, uh, in your kindness, speak to me, uh, speak to us all through the words that I've prepared. We pray that uh, you might help me to speak truthfully uh, and for your word to go to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope that you are not too old to remember what it was like to be a school student, to be back in high school, uh, on an occasion when the teacher had not shown up. Uh, at my high school, if the teacher failed to show up for the lesson and we were unsupervised for 45 minutes, we used to call it a bludge period. On one uh, particular day, the timetable indicated that we had a double period of maths, an entire hour and a half, uh, and at the start of the lesson, our teacher, Mrs. Cannon, had not shown up. Well, this went on for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, no Mrs. Cannon, 30 minutes, no Mrs. Cannon, until it seemed very clear that she was not coming and we were destined to have an hour and a half's bludge period. But at around the halfway mark, when period one turned to period two, and the classroom was at a peak of raucousness, I can still hear it to this very day. Mrs. Cannon passed away last year, shortly before our, our school reunion. Uh, Mrs. Cannon was Portuguese, and I can still hear to this very day her voice piercing the raucousness of the classroom as she said, right. She had simply had her days wrong, and uh, she thought that she had a free period, so she'd gone for a walk. But at the end of that period, she returned and she quickly set things to rights in the classroom and she got us working hard. Now, I went to a pretty straight-laced school, so there was rarely anything life-threatening that took place when the teacher wasn't there. Though I can remember one occasion when somebody threw a large wooden blackboard duster at a boy and drew an impressive amount of blood. In any case, it made an enormous difference when the teacher returned to the classroom. The teacher restored order. They punished those who had been doing the wrong thing. It probably is an exaggeration to say they also rewarded those who were doing the right thing. They, they expected that, but, but they set things to rights. This world is like a classroom where the teacher is away. Every human, to some extent, is taking advantage of the situation to do what they want, thinking that the teacher is not coming back. The Bible teaches us, and the prophets especially announce, that the teacher is coming back. The disorder and the impunity will not continue indefinitely. The prophet Micah 
whom we read as our Old Testament reading today, and we're going to cover during this Advent series because uh, he's one of the prophets that announces the coming of Jesus hundreds of years before. The prophet an, uh, an announced to his contemporaries, and this is Micah chapter 1, verse 3. It's not printed for us in our yellow sheet, but it's in your Bibles on page 797. He says this, Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and treads on the heights of the earth. The mountains melt beneath him and the valleys split apart. The Lord is coming. Now, there was a clear worldly event that Micah was speaking about. It was the invasion of the northern kingdom of Israel by the Assyrians in 722 BC. The northern kingdom fell to the Assyrians. The people were carried off into exile. And as it says in chapter 1, verse 6, God had said he would make Samaria a heap of rubble. This was a human event, but it was God's doing. This was God coming to hold his people to account for their idolatry, for their wickedness to each other, and for their turning away from him. Now, Micah was speaking to the southern kingdom, also called Judah. He was warning them to turn back to God, to turn away from their idols, Otherwise, God would come against them as he had with the northern kingdom. God did eventually come against the southern kingdom as well in 586 BC when Jerusalem fell and people there were carried off to exile in Babylon. But those comings of God to judge and punish throughout human history, they are just signs and precursors to the great more literal, if you like, coming of God, when he comes and makes himself visible to all humanity. That time when everyone will see for themselves that he is the Lord and when he'll hold humanity to account. Now, what they didn't understand in those days that this, is this, this great literal coming of God would be divided in two. Firstly, Jesus coming humbly. Uh, as a baby who would grow up to be the crucified saviour and his second coming for which we are still waiting and we uh, hope every week in the apostles creed his second coming as the judge from where we sit we understand a great deal more about god's purposes than they did in micah's day we know that jesus has been and we know that he is coming again and as Jesus taught in the gospel reading from Mark, we are to be ready. That's the clear command. Be ready for his return because you do not know when it will be. So for us, it's even more true, if you like, than it was in Micah's day, that the Lord is coming. So we can learn from Micah and his contemporaries how we should respond to the news. Uh, this is my second point, if you're following the outline, responding to the news, and I have three reflections on this. The first one is, pay attention. I want you to notice that the prophet demanded the attention of the people. Chapter 1, verse 2, Hear you peoples, all of you, listen, earth, and all who live in it, that the sovereign Lord may bear witness against you. The announcement that the Lord is coming is one that demands attention. And that is part of the nature of the message. In order to be faithful to the message, if you and I, for example, are sharing the message with somebody else, it's necessary to state it in a manner that demands attention. That doesn't necessarily just mean louder, but we must, we must expect people's attention. That is how Micah and all of the prophets operated. I once heard a story of a wife who was wanting to get back at her husband for the fact that he never listened to her. Uh, it just so happened that the husband had to catch an early plane and he had asked his wife to remind him. So she wrote him a note, you need to be at the airport in one hour. 
and she placed the note on his bedside table right next to where he was sound asleep in bed. Now, I don't know where I heard that story, and I rather doubt that it's true, but you get the point. Uh, if, you, if, you leave a, if you leave a written note to someone that they need to wake up, it's not going to hit, hit the mark, is it? It's possible to deliver a message in such an inappropriate way that it won't be heard and it won't be acted on. The prophetic message that the Lord is coming must be heard and it must be acted on. I heard another story, which I believe is true, of an evangelical revival preacher. It was a Wesley or a Whitfield or one of those guys who saw a man sleeping during his sermon. He stopped preaching. He singled out the man and he said, You, sir, I must be heard and I will be heard. Was that the right thing to do? Perhaps in the circumstances it was. I have not always felt led to do that when I've seen somebody drifting in one of my sermons. But I think what's right about it is that the, the, the message is of life and death importance. And that needs to be conveyed. Otherwise, the message is not being conveyed truthfully. So, first point is pay attention, expect attention. Uh, my second reflection on how to respond to the message of the Lord's coming is that we must, whether we're hearers of the message or whether we're speakers of the message, we must be appropriately sad and compassionate at God's judgment on people. Sadness and compassion are different and both are necessary. In chapter 1, verses 8 to 16, again, you can find that in the printed Bibles, not in the yellow sheet, uh, we get an insight into Micah himself and it seems clear that Micah was a, quite a, an emotional and a, and a demonstrative person who was bound up with his message. So it says in verse 8, Because of this I will weep and wail. I will go about barefoot and naked. I will howl like a jackal and moan like an owl. Howling like a jackal. Now that's an intense response, isn't it? And then Micah takes us on a tour of various places. Gath, Beth Ophrah, Shafir, and his own hometown of Moresheth. And he shows us the people there in mourning, in Beth Ophrah, which means house of dust, he says, roll in the dust. Now, I figure that these are all places near where Micah grew up. These are his people who are coming under God's judgment. They're in mourning at the impact of this Assyrian invasion, which, let's not forget, has been sent by God. Micah is compassionate on his people and he's personally sad for his neighbourhood. And as Christians who believe that the Lord is coming in judgment and, and knowing that so many people out there in Randwick and around the world today are simply oblivious to the judgment which is coming on them, should we be compassionate and sad for the loss? Yes, of course we should. It is sad for those who come under God's judgment. And we haven't understood or communicated the message unless that is apparent. My third reflection is this. We must steer clear of the false prophets with their comforting lies. Chapter 2, verses 6 to 11, which, which is printed for us, uh, give us a sense of how Micah was received by his contemporaries. Micah must, of course, have had a little band of disciples who believed in him, but he certainly had opponents. Chapter 2, verse 6. Do not prophesy, their prophets say. Do not prophesy these things. Disgrace will not overtake us. The message of Micah's opponents was... Don't worry, there's no need for any moral change. There's no need for a return to God, he hasn't left us. Nothing bad is going to happen. 
Now that message exists in every generation. It is a convenient, comforting message. It's basically the message which nullifies the whole gospel of Jesus because it says that no response is required. And naturally it comes in many different forms. And because the devil is cunning, there will always be an element of truth. There will always be a veneer of morality to the false prophet's message. But they all boil down to the same thing. Anyone who offers comfort to the complacent is one of these false prophets. Now, you have got to love Micah in chapter 2, verse 11, where he shows that he's probably an Australian. If a liar and deceiver comes and says, I will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, that would be the prophet for these people. Now, you can be sure such a prophet will be well received in Australia, can't you? False prophets will always get a hearing because there's a market for them. Of course, people like it when they're told you can do exactly what you want and, 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 people, and, and, and you give them, giving people spiritual comfort for doing exactly what they want. Of course, people want that. But the message of the false prophets is ultimately a silly one. The false prophets are the guys who are insisting you can keep on doing what you like permanently because the teacher will never return to the classroom. Never. The false prophets are the, the kids at school who are so cool and so popular because it's so fun to muck up when the teacher's not there but they don't look so good when the teacher actually returns, do they? When their advice is suddenly looking rather bad. So you see, the false prophet's message is a silly one. It's also wicked. What a wicked thing it is to do, to give people false comfort. To tell people that they're fine when they're really rushing down the path to destruction. And how sad to indulge in false comfort when there is real comfort to be had. Chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 are the voice of God. I will surely gather all of you, Jacob. I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. And at the end of the verse, the king will pass through before them, the Lord at their head. The tone of the book of Micah seems to me that these words of promise and comfort, they're, they're whispered. But they're whispered with the sureness of a God who even 2,750 years ago had an unbreakable resolve to save his people. Was God going to come in judgment? Yes, of course he would but he would also provide a way for his faithful ones to escape the judgment and be his forever. There was real comfort to be had by trusting that promise of God. There was comfort then and there is comfort now. Sure, it can be fun while the teacher is away as long as the chaos doesn't degenerate too much. But ultimately in our world, the real comfort is knowing that the teacher is returning and will set everything right. So, to conclude, how to be prophetic? Or maybe by uh, promising that I'm jumping the gun, maybe some of us don't want to be prophetic just yet. It's a certainly a hard road, isn't it, to be a prophet? But first of all, we must believe the prophetic message that the Lord is returning to judge and to save. And therefore, we need to have turned from our sins and be ready, waiting for Jesus to return. And if we're to share the message with the world, then we would do well to remember that it demands attention because it's life and death. We do well to remember that we ought to be sad and compassionate at God's judgment coming on those around us. 
but to avoid the false comfort of the false prophets and to seek the true comfort that is in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we praise you that Jesus is returning to judge and to save. We pray that we might be ready and we ask, please, that you would give us a way of being prophets among the people that we know in the world to point them to the real hope that is in Jesus. Amen. Our offertory hymn is hymn number 272, Come Now Long Expected Jesus. <clears throat> Let us pray for all people and the church around the world. <clears throat> this is the season of Jesus' coming. It is time to wake from sleep. His coming is the advent of saving love. His coming is good news for the poor, freedom for the captives, sight for the blind, liberty for the oppressed, and acceptance for the unacceptable. Then those who were lame will leap like deer, and those who couldn't speak will shout for joy. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Lord, you are the God who loves your people and who provides for those in need. We pray that help and support will reach all those in need in the Middle East. Father, there is so much pain and conflict. So we pray for leaders throughout the region to turn their hearts towards peace. Give them wi wisdom, rescue the captives, shield those in danger and bind up the brokenhearted. 
Above all, we pray that the people of the Middle East will find everlasting hope in you and in the land of your son's birth. Turn hearts to look to the Saviour and live. Loving God, we pray for the members of Uni Church as they meet together each Sunday for fellowship, to praise you and to study your word. May they grow in their faith and as they provide witness to other students on campus, more people will be brought into your kingdom. God of all truth, we thank you for the contribution that Claremont College makes to the education in the Randwick area. We ask you to continue to bless students and staff. May the college be a place where students are respected and valued and where staff witness to God's love by the way they look after and teach their students. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that St Jude Sunday School provides for young people to meet you and develop their understanding of your life-saving gift. We thank you for the dedication of the Sunday School teachers as they prepare each week to teach the students. Refresh them over the holidays and bring, back their bring them back enthusiastic and prepared for the new year. Help the students to understand and solidify their knowledge each week. Bring more local children into the class so that they can learn about you. Gracious God, we are so thankful for the beautiful grounds you have provided here at St Jude's. As we use these next Sunday to welcome many in the community to celebrate, celebrate Christmas with carols, we pray for fine weather, smooth running and many volunteers to help. We ask that the hearts of those who attend will be so moved that they will desire to return to learn more about your saving grace. We turn to our yellow bulletin. Almighty, um, sorry, we pray that you will lead the nations of the world in the ways of righteousness and peace and guide their rulers in wisdom and justice for the tranquility and good of all. Bless especially your servant Charles, our King, his representatives and ministers, remembering today especially Chris Minns, our Premier, his parliaments and all who exercise authority in this land. Grant that they may impartially administer justice, restrain wickedness and vice, and uphold integrity and truth. We beseech you to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity and concord, and grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially our Archbishop Kanishka, our Bishop Michael, uh, our Rector Andrew, Andrew, Jim and Emma, that by their life and doctrine they may set forth your true life-giving word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. And to all your people give your heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that they may receive your word with meek hearts and due reverence and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We ask you of your goodness, Lord, to comfort and sustain all named in our prayer journal and all who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness or any other adversity. We also bless your holy name for all your servants who have died in the faith of Christ. Give us grace to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of your heavenly kingdom. Grant this, Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. 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 You who truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbours and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to strengthen and comfort you. But first, let us make a humble confession of our sins to Almighty God. <laughs> 
Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we acknowledge the shame the sins we have committed by thought, word and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us. We earnestly repent and heartily sorry for all our misdoings. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may hereafter serve and please you in newness of life to the honour and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all who with hearty repentance and true faith turn to him, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in the eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Him is in number 265. We omit verse 3 of 265. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. <clears throat> the words of assurance for those who truly turn to Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And the saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Therefore lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, 
Lord, mighty creator and eternal God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory to you, O Lord most high. Let us pray. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. All glory to you, our Heavenly Father, for in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death on the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given you thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. And I now take and eat in remembrance that Christ died for me and feed on him in my heart by faith with thanksgiving. And I drink this remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for me, and I'm thankful.
Let us pray. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord and Heavenly Father, we, your humble servants, entirely desire your fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and to grant that by the merits and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy and living sacrifice, humbly beseeching you that all we who are partakers of of this holy sacrament, communion, may be fulfilled with your grace and heavenly benediction, benediction. And although we are unworthy through our many sins to offer you any sacrifice, yet we pray that you will accept this, our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offences, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours. Father, world without end. Amen. peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ.